And Sunday is a special day for Christians, but we acknowledge that faith comes in all shapes and sizes. Each week on The Political Correction, we aim to talk to someone at the heart of his or her community to talk about what brings us together. In other words, our common ground. As we all know, Sunday mornings can be a rather busy time for those within religious communities. So yesterday, Arlene Foster spoke with Fergus Butler Galley, an Anglican clergyman and author, and here's what he had to say. Oh, welcome, uh, Fergus, and thank you for joining me uh, this afternoon. I know that there's three issues that you wanted to cover in our short term together, but uh, what's your first issue about? Absolutely. Well, it's, it's very nice to be with you and be speaking with you now. Um, well, first, I think what we've seen, all the news in the past, well, it seems an awfully long time, but certainly the past couple of weeks, I think there is a real uh, an issue of crisis of trust in our institutions. And we've seen it this week um, with the Metropolitan Police. I know that's a story that is leading across um, news channels. That has been a long burning, a long boiling story. There is a serious uh, crisis of trust, I think, in terms of um, revelations around the COVID rules, et cetera, et cetera, and how the government itself was behaving. And I think, actually, whilst these these are related to very specific scandals and specific um, failures of, of standards by those people in power, uh, I think there's something, it, it's, it says something that is indicative, to my mind, of a real problem that we have in, in this country, arguably across the West, with, or indeed across the world, with, with a sort of crisis of faith in institutions. Um, and in some ways that is, that is hugely deserved. You know, you look at institutions, be that the Metropolitan Police, be that Parliament, be that the Church of England or any of the churches, really. Um, and there is an increasing failure, I think, to address serious problems. And, and that is fundamentally why Cressida Dick, or the stated reason why Cressida Dick is gone, is there is no longer confidence in her to deliver uh, the changes needed to the Metropolitan Police. But in many of these institutions, I think there is a lack of, there is a serious lack of accountability. And then there's an awful lot of marking our own homework, uh, of, of internal investigations. I don't think anyone really expected the Grey Report to be, you know, to lead to anything. I think, I think that was probably... A mistake if they did because there's and I think when, when I when you speak to ordinary people I think there is just there is a weariness and an expectation actually that institutions will do wrong um and will 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 simply cover their own tracks uh, and I there's often affection for the individual you speak to individual people they say well actually my individual MP is working very hard for me my local parish priest is working very hard for me my local doctor is is working very hard for me but but there is just such a gulf between the institutions that that people like me represent and and the actual people we're meant to serve. And I noticed that one of the issues that have been raised, we take the Metropolitan Police uh, as an example of one of those institutions, is that Cressida Dick has been accused of being far too defensive of her organisation when uh, charges were laid. Um, and my goodness, there's been a number of issues that have been laid before the Metropolitan Police recently. I mean, I suppose on one hand, uh, people say actually she was standing up for her rank and file officers, but mm. to other people looking into the institution, she's been defensive. And that's the tension, isn't it, Fergus, in relation to institutions that's standing up for the institution, or are you actually not allowing the accountability to come in? Absolutely. And I think I think at the root of all this is there's, there's a question of confidence. Because I think an institution that has a healthy level of confidence in itself can take criticism and say, you know what, we're doing things wrong and we are confident enough in the good things that we're doing to try and address those things where we're doing wrong. You know, we are confident enough in, in these aspects of local policing to try and address racism, to try and address, you know, the issues around, around the, the Sarah Everard case and, and the sort of tragedy that unfolded from that. But if, if an institution is not confident enough, it becomes defensive. And we see this in the Church of England all the time across churches where there's sort of a siege mentality. And so when valid criticism comes up, there isn't a sense. And I think if you love an institution, and I, you know, I do, the Church of England drives me mad, but I, but I love it and I believe in what it does. But if you love it, you, you actually want it to do better and be better. And, and I think we do no favours by defensiveness because are you in the long term serving those rank and file people better by, by saying, look, there are things we need to, to, to talk about, things we need to engage with, things we need to address, 
or are you you simply saying actually no i'm going to be super defense i'm going to put the put the sort of screens up or at the very best i'm going to investigate it myself and, and i think it comes to you know a chronic problem in modern life is a lack of conversation and a lack of, yeah. of, of people talking you know i know the title of, of, of this slot is common ground and uh, it, you you will have people from across political and religious spectrums you know and if 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 we are not talking and engaging, then we are not going to address these things. And then when an institution says we're not talking, this is our business, not yours. Yes. It doesn't do any favours to anybody, really. Yes, indeed. And we've seen that uh, in uh, Northern Ireland, where we had horrific issues around child abuse, uh, the historic child abuse, where uh, initially there was a lot of defensiveness. Exactly. Uh, but looking, looking wider than Fergus, your second issue that you wanted to talk about uh, today was uh, the issue of the persecution of Christians across the world. Absolutely. And, and it is something that is endemic. And, and you know, I know the Bishop of Truro is, is advising the government. Uh, Fiona Bruce MP is, is one of the champions. And they are doing sterling work but it but it strikes me as just completely mind-boggling how this isn't higher up you know people's yeah. register and i think there is a real problem again in you know we, we associate christianity with being you know the established religion of this country with being um you know comfortable perhaps declining but that's its own problem and in truth christianity is a is the most important global force shaping you know, it is the largest religion on the face of this planet it is it is comes in every shade it comes in every color it comes from every single country and and so to to for us to sort of to my mind for, for any government that has a commitment to human rights has a commitment saying you know there are protected characteristics etc cetera, etc cetera, any that believes in freedom of belief to be quite so sort of and i have to say britain is probably doing better on this than, than many other mm. countries but to be quite so blasé and quite so cynical i think about the plight of people you know, across the Middle East, um, the plight to people in, in it's like northern Nigeria, uh, parts of Africa where massacres are just completely everyday, you know, occurrences. And of course, in China, where, where alongside the appalling, appalling genocide of the Uyghur Muslims and, and the you know, suppression of belief across society there, you have persecution of Christians as well. And, and, and I think really, you know, the world is, the Archbishop of Canterbury has a quote he likes to point out that the uh, the demographic nature of, of the world I means even the average Anglican is a woman in her 20s in sub-Saharan Africa. And so the demographic future of the world is more and not less religious. Uh, and I think the West will be judged retrospectively for failing. And particularly those of us who are Western Christians, I don't say this as a kind of stick to bash others with. It's, it's partly a, a mea culpa, you know, something I pray about, but what more can I do to support those, you know, my brothers and sisters? And, and I think it's it's something that the, the future generations will look back on our failure to protect people of faith um, yeah. more generally uh, across the world as a real failing of, of, of the West dying days. Really. Yeah. And, and of course, we hear quite a bit about the Uyghur Muslims in, in China because of what's going on there. But you're right, we don't hear very much about uh, what's happening to Christian communities um, having to worship underground and what have you. And uh, actually, I was reading Open Doors recently and they were saying uh, in a publication that Afghanistan now is the number one area for the yeah. persecution of Christians. And again, that brings you back to what happened with the withdrawal of troops uh, in August. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And, and I think we have to take a degree of, of, of moral responsibility for that. And it's links in in some ways to our... Um, our what we were talking about with institutions that we can mm. be defensive about it or we can try and explain it away through real politique but actually at some point there has to be an honest thing saying that we failed and what can we now do to try and make that better indeed and the, and the last issue is a very uh localized issue for us in uh, the uk and that's around the cost of living and you, you've been traveling about the uk and noting how it's impacting on various communities uh, across the uk Absolutely. I've been been in, you know, in the last couple of months or so since this, it became clear that this was coming since winter set in. Um, I've been in uh, Burnley. I've been in Bradford. I've been in Liverpool. I've been in Kent. I've been in London. Uh, I've been visiting, you know, churches and community groups. And there is a real fear out there about what this cost of living is going to do. And it may seem like the macro dictating, the micro rather dictating the macro in that, if I would say to you, well, you know, a, a book group in 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 hosted in a church in 
AN town somewhere in the Midlands is going to shut down because it cannot afford the heating and because people in the book group no longer can afford the extra you know, cost per month of, of, of membership. That could be a matter of two or three people, but then another community asset collapses. And you know, that community asset is helping keep this church going. That church is helping keep you know, people warm, helping them, you know, giving them frankly in the, the crisis we're really facing, which I think is around hope and around mental health, you know, giving people a space if that church then closed. So these little increments, which, you know, it may, people may say, oh, well, it's, it's just individual heating bills. It isn't at all. And, and we are suffering a real crisis in terms of what, you know, what the sort of Cameron government wanted to call the kind of little platoons, but those, but the absolute building blocks of, of conversation, of, of, of the interpersonal in, on a small scale, in, in villages, in towns, in, in post specific postcodes in cities. And the cost of living crisis is gonna squeeze that even more, just as, you know, swinging cuts will happen to, to government budgets, just as, you know, if anything, the churches and, you know, people of faith are needed more than any other time to, to create those building blocks, to create those spaces where communities can come together, can learn from one another, can engage with one another. Um, and I, I if it's a case of not being able to heat the hall, as I've you know heard from in 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 some of my travels, it's a case of no longer having enough volunteers because people are can't give up the time because they're having to take extra jobs. We are going to face a societal crisis, really. And of course, Ferguson will end on this, but this this comes off the back of being isolated because of COVID, and then if yeah. people can't get out to their little community groups as well, that's going to continue that isolation and as you say lead to all sorts of societal yeah. issues but also mental health issues and health issues for the individual as well and particularly people in in vulnerable and marginalized groups you know people who who, who often are not considered to be part of you know the wider you know they're not necessarily economically useful they might be older isolated people etc cetera, etc cetera. and 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 they are going to be the ones who suffer and i would say you know as a final note i you know, done a number of funerals over the COVID period, um, done people who, who very tragically died of COVID. I think I've probably done as many funerals of older people who have simply given up on, on life because those community, you know, instruction, those community groups, those community engagement, those moments where for them it might be once a week, it might be the only time that they had contact. And removing that kills people, quite quite literally. And so I think we... When we have an eye on the cost of living crisis, when we have an eye, and of course there's a million different factors here, whether it's you know, green stuff or whether it's public finances, uh, just a, a final plea that, that you know, some of those things that might seem unimportant, they might seem little, they might seem local, are actually quite literally keeping people, people, keeping people going. Well, Fergus, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Thank you. I look forward to speaking to you again in the future on our slot of Common Ground. Lovely to speak to you. Thank you very much.